Hello and welcome. How effective are sanctions against an impoverished country like Myanmar and could the move to engage be more productive? There's a growing debate as the country, also known as Burma, has raised the prospect of elections for the first time in 20 years. According to some aid agencies, Myanmar has become the largest source of refugees in Southeast Asia after six decades of ethnic and political conflicts, an issue that concerns neighboring countries such as China, India and Thailand. The military government, which has kept Myanmar isolated for half a century, announced laws that could set the stage for a national vote, although how free and fair it will be is in question, particularly after the National League for Democracy, led by Nobel Peace Laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, was forced to disband. Critics believe that any upcoming election will be an echo of the 1990 vote, where Suu Kyi won, but was prevented from taking office because the military ignored the result and put her under house arrest soon after. U.S. President Barack Obama has adopted a policy of pragmatic engagement, where sanctions will be maintained against the country while trying to bring some degree of direct dialogue with senior leaders of the regime. U.S. Special Envoy Kurt Campbell called his recent talks with the government disappointing as the regime dismissed proposals for a national dialogue involving all stakeholders. On today's show, we ask what new approach could there be to Myanmar and could it be engagement over sanctions? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments, send an SMS or an email, and we'll also welcome your phone calls onto the show too. To discuss the issues, I'm joined by Zoya Pan, an activist from Myanmar, also known as Burma, of course, escaped from the regime uh, against its ongoing war against the Karen ethnic group. She's pushed for, pushed for tougher sanctions against the government and as campaigns officer with the Burma Campaign UK, she protests for human rights and democracy in her country. Zoya recently published Undaunted, My Struggle for Freedom and Survival in Burma. Also with us is Justin Wintel, a British historian and journalist. He's criticized Aung San Suu Kyi for supporting Western economic sanctions, which he argues have, quote, helped drive the regime deeper into the embrace of China. He's the author of The Perfect Hostage, A Life of Aung San Suu Kyi. Thank you both for joining us. And Zoya Pan, if I could start with you, your priority, of course, is to try to get the uh, United Nations to um, bring some kind of action against the regime in Burma, ideally to try them for war crimes. What grounds are you going to be able to put forward? How can you convince the UN to take this action? Well, um, the democracy movement in Burma has been asking for many years to get the United Nations and uh, international community especially to impose more stronger action against the dictatorship in Burma. And when we look at the crimes that the regime has been committing in Burma, they are not just um, ordinary uh, human rights violations, they are breaking international law in terms of the use of rape as a weapon of war. And they are soldiers, rape girls as young as five years old, and thousands and thousands of people have been used as slave labor it's as a forced labor, and thousands have been displaced systematically and widespread, not just in eastern part of Burma and the whole uh, area in Burma. And more than 3,300 villages have been displaced mm -hmm. and forced to flee from their homes because the regime has systematic policy to destroy and attack these villages. Zoya, let me and ask this you, is breaking uh, international law. Right, let me ask you one thing. Now, of course, the regime in the country is, is essentially faceless, unlike the situation where you had in Iraq, you had Saddam Hussein, Sudan, of course, uh, President Omar al-Bashir has the International Criminal Court chasing him. These countries where there has been some kind of issue uh, have a figurehead, and, and, and largely with, with you know the Burmese leadership, there's been no major face or figurehead that the international community can sort of latch on to. Is that, has that presented a problem when it's trying to state your case and build a kind of consensus against uh, the leadership there? Actually, we do have the Aung San Suu Kyi, um, who is the leader of the National League for Democracy, a party that uh, won the 1990 election I, I and meant, uh, also yeah. she I meant, is a sorry, Nobel yeah. Peace Laureate. I, I meant, I yeah. meant in terms of like a bad guy, in terms of having, you know, the rallying the international community, usually they need to, to have a more visible bad guy, if you get my meaning, whereas here you've got like a faceless regime. Oh, right. Mm. Mm. Well, in Burma, um, the, the head of the dictatorship is Tan Shui, but actually this dictatorship is a committee, it's like a series of committee and they started their military coup in 1962 and one committee after another and this current dictatorship is called the State Peace and Development Council and this dictatorship is comprised of different generals 
and these generals have the policy of ethnic cleansing, attacking civilians, and systematically torturing and oppressing dissidents in Burma. Mm. That's why democracy movement in Burma have been calling for the international community to impose more targeted economic sanction against the regime and okay. force the regime into negotiating table with oppositions and uh, also right. ethnic nationalities group. Well, let me get, let me bring in Justin Wintel. Glad, glad to have you with us as well, sir. Now, let me ask you, you, of course, your views are a little different when it comes to what approach should be taken with uh, with the leadership there, the regime in, in Myanmar, in Burma. Let me ask you what you feel has been uh, wrong with the approach of sanctions. Where have they really failed? Okay. Um, I preface anything I say about Burma, Myanmar, uh, by saying that I absolutely deplore the human rights violations that go on there. Uh, it's a pretty awful regime. Uh, I have great sympathy with, with people like, like Zoya Pan uh, and the struggle that she's had, uh, both personally and, and for her, her, her people. The problems are, if you go to pick up the theme of a commission of inquiry, a UN commission of inquiry, it is so unlikely that that can happen without the agreement of China and Russia. Um, and uh, really we're not going to get that, I'm afraid. I'd be all for a commission of inquiry if it could be made to happen, but I don't think it will be made to happen. Turning to sanctions, sanctions was, was worth trying. You said that I criticized uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, for supporting sanctions against Burma. Uh, she's actually changed that, that view, view recently. My view was that sanctions was worth trying for a while, but as soon as it, it, it became obvious, as it has, uh, that they've had no effect at all, and indeed, some would argue, many academics would argue, and I would sympathize with the view, uh, that sanctions have been counterproductive in two or three ways. One is that because they have, in an age of globalization, they have isolated Burma from uh, full throttle globalization, so that business hasn't picked up, employment opportunities are fewer, and, and so ordinary people are hit by sanctions. Targeted sanctions, fine, if you can make them work, I don't think you can, because uh, these Burmese generals, they had bank accounts in Singapore, etc. Let me make one more point, which is sanctions have actually pushed Myanmar into the arms of China, especially. And China doesn't care about human rights particularly. Well, let's get a caller. And we've got Andrew on the line from Ghana with a question. We take viewers' questions on this show. So, Andrew, go ahead, please. Yeah, I was asking, why is it the UN not coming in to fight for the people of uh, Myanmar? Okay. They, have, they have been ruled by military governments. The civilians are being maligned. The, the, is it that the country that has nothing to offer for the European countries or the Western countries? Let me let me get uh, thank, Andrew. Thank, Andrew, thanks for that. Let me get Zoya Pan to, to respond to this. Uh, what what do you feel is the reason that the situation in, in in Burma and Myanmar has been allowed to go on so long the way it has? Why do you think the international community has had more interest elsewhere and and has has essentially not given as much thought to this uh, the process there? Yes, it is a sad fact that international community has been ignoring Burma for so long. And I don't understand why. People in Burma desperately need help. And we, our life under military dictatorship is so enough. And we've seen softly, softly approach from the United Nations that hasn't worked. It hasn't gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. 40 visits by UN in the country hasn't changed any significant political me, situation in you, Burma. Let me ask you, sorry, uh, let me ask you, uh, Justin Wintel there had said that, you know, he, he, re he recognizes there's desperately a need for change, but has also pointed out that if there's been no result with sanctions, there has to be a different approach. Why, why do you still push for such hard sanctions against uh, the regime there? Well, we haven't got the effective sanction that we've been asking for yet. For many years, democracy movement in Burma have been asking for targeted sanction, including oil and gas sectors, and jam and timbers and financial transaction. But we haven't got this from many countries, although we have some limited sanction from the European Union and from United States. Canada and other countries, but still these sanctions haven't been coordinated well. That's why democracy movement in Burma have been asking for more targeted sanctions. And we still see uh, Total, which is a European company, and Chevron, a US company, still investing in Burma, providing billions of dollars every year to the dictatorship 
and the dictatorship used this money on arms and attacking civilians like myself. And actually, sanction is only s uh, one of many ways to put to force the regime and to put them into negotiating okay. table and we haven't received it yet and no. many Asian companies including Chinese and Indian companies when they've invest in Burma and they got insurance covered by European companies okay let me let me get Justin Wintle to answer one thing uh, Justin you've written about uh, Nobel yeah. Peace Laureate Aung San Suu Kyi who of course has become the face of the democracy movement in in uh, in, in Myanmar yeah. in Burma let me ask you I mean, her, certainly her image resonates with the West and it's been obviously largely romanticized in the Western media uh, but how does it resonate or how does she resonate with people in East Asia well, um, she's an icon there as well. I mean, I remember in Bangkok a couple of years ago, I saw these food stalls in one of the markets, and uh, uh, and they had these Aung San Suu Kyi noodle stores. She um, occasionally in in Bangkok and, and other places in East Asia, I wear my Aung San Suu Kyi T-shirt, and uh, commands immediate respect and interest. And yes, she is. Um, probably idolized as much in Southeast Asia as she is in the West. Okay, we're going to look at more issues uh, in just a moment. We're going to take a very short break and we'll continue our discussion when we return. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back. We're examining the impact of sanctions on Myanmar, the country also known as Burma, and whether or not closer engagement with the military regime there might promote some democratic changes. My guests are Zoya Pan, an activist who serves as campaigns officer with the Burma Campaign UK, pushing for human rights and democracy in her country and advocating tougher sanctions, and Justin Wintle, a British historian and journalist who believes economic sanctions against Myanmar has simply failed to produce any results. We've got a caller on the line from the UK. Colin, what would you like to ask? Hi, Rose. Yes, um... Just one, one quick comment. Um, I can't understand why a country like Britain, who used to basically rule Burma, um, has, has basically left them to um, their own devices, which has been disastrous, and, and yet we will invade other countries or, um, with America and other Western um, allies where we think we have a better interest. Yeah. You know, obviously I'm talking about um, Iraq and now Afghanistan. We've lost many soldiers. And the Burmese are actually, or the government, are, are attacking Christians in, their, in that, that country. And as a fellow Christian, and someone who I think should so, show some responsibility, right. I feel sorry for the people of Burma. And right. I think we should, we should get involved in, in countries like that rather than well, Colin, Arabia, which has given us a bad name. Right. right. Colin, actually, it's an interesting point you raised there. And I'm going to ask Zoya here to also answer it uh, along with an email, because America, the U.S., has been playing a bigger role here. And this email came up from uh, Khawaja Ikramul Haq in Pakistan, Zoya. It says... It does not seem to be a pragmatic, but rather a devilish diplomacy if the Obama administration supports the military regime in Myanmar because this neglects the human rights situation and reality in the country. Now, what's happened is, of course, President Obama has said he's looking at uh, pragmatic engagement. How do you regard the way the United States is approaching uh, your country? Of course, you know, it's, it, a, lot of been, a lot of people were expecting something to come out of the meetings with uh, his, uh, the president's envoy, Kurt Campbell, but not much seemed to come out of that. Well, yes, um, the, the United Kingdom and the United States have been very strong on Burma, and we really appreciate this And in terms of promoting human rights and democracy in Burma. And when you look at um, pragmatic engagement that President Obama administration has, um, has been uh, doing this, um, we do agree, we, we do um, appreciate high-level engagement, but this should be very critical engagement with teeth that's mean with enough pressure behind because this dictatorship in Burma they won't respond to softly softly approach by international community and they will respond only when they feel pressure and the fact that they didn't take uh, Kurt Campbell's visit to Burma seriously is because United States hasn't got enough and strong action and sanction against the dictatorship in Burma. Mm -hmm. And they are not interested in reform and the dictatorship in Burma, they are not interested in uh, transition to democracy. The only way we can 
force the regime is by putting more pressure on the dictatorship okay. in Burma. But now and talk, uh, when engaging with Burma, mm -hmm. and when engaging with Burma, it's very important to remember an international community should also involve the democracy movement and also ethnic nationalities groups that are genuinely representing the people. Okay, let me get Justin Wintle back in here and put a couple of emails to you. We got on the, the, the prospect for an election that's, uh, that's been announced. I'm going to read these back to back, if I may, sir. The first one from Omar Farouk uh, Hagadera, who sent it through Facebook, saying, how do the people in Myanmar look, upon, uh, look at the upcoming election? And does the military government have the resource and knowledge to conduct free and fair elections? Um, another one that came in from uh, the USA, from Travis Malakpour, says, it can be doubted that elections in Myanmar will be fair. Even if the oppositional parties should win, the military junta will find a way to flush them out again. And the third one that came in on the same theme uh, from Michelle Ahmed in Bangladesh wrote in saying, Aung San Suu Kyi has failed to become a leader of the people of Myanmar. Her followers are equally ineffective and lack the conviction to oust the junta from its rule. Uh, it's a shame that military, the military rules uh, still rules and the election will be nothing but a farce. Now, of course, uh, uh, the, the NLD uh, has, has uh, dropped out because uh, Aung San Suu Kyi wouldn't be able to be represented. So is it even worth trying to hold these elections as far as the uh, regime is concerned? Well, I think that the result of this um, this election is a foregone con conclusion. Uh, the regime will make absolutely sure this time, having uh, done so uh, ignominiously badly in 1990, the uh, regime will make sure that they get the result that they want. Um, uh, now, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, under very, very tough uh, penal um, election laws, electoral laws, um, anybody who is in detention or under house arrest or anything like that uh, cannot stand, cannot participate in the elections. Therefore, were the NLD to, stand, uh, to, to run in the election, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, would have had to resign as its leader. Right. Uh, but it's not, it's not that which is the issue with the NLD. They, they are saying, from Aung San Suu Kyi down, uh, that the framework for these elections is simply not democratic at all. Therefore, they have no wish to participate in them. There is, by the way, a breakaway group from the NLD called the um, uh, NF which is the National Force for Democracy, uh, which are, are going to participate in elections. But I think the people of Burma, coming back to the first point, uh, will be very, very aware that the NLD is not standing, that Aung San Suu Kyi uh, is not standing. And although she's been criticized uh, for asking the NLD uh, not not to participate I in the elections that i think will will make the point it'll be an empty election if she's not in it right. um, let me ask uh, uh, zoya here at this point uh, your your background of course is from the uh, the current ethnic people who have been targeted by the regime in particular and of course the the, the current rebels are known for their their stand against the uh, the military regime there let me ask you if you feel to what degree you feel there is unity among the people in the country uh, in line with the, the current people. Is there any kind of uh, sense of division or unity between uh, the people in wanting a common goal when it comes to the regime? Well, um, there is a very clear line uh, between the dictatorship and the people. And when you look at the dictatorship side, there are corrupted people and a few um, business cronies and the, these few minorities are trying to grip on power. And against the dictatorship, there are people who genuinely ask for democracy, who want to see change, who care about the people. And these sides are the people like the Aung San Suu Kyi and other uh, democracy movement, the Korean National Union and other ethnic groups. And these groups are all of them, they have agreed on the establishment of a democratic federal Burma, where regardless of your race, regardless of your gender, your ethnicity, your religion, everyone are equal and everyone should be treated equally. And they have been struggling and fighting to get <coughs> this democratic federal Burma. Mm -hmm. And they haven't got uh, enough support from international community. That's why it is very important for international community, if you want to see a serious change in Burma, it is very important to support the democracy movement in Burma. Okay. And they are ready to give their lives 
I've got, I've got a, about a minute and a half, uh, uh, Justin. If I may uh, ask you, what do you expect the future to be when you have a, a country that's been so isolated, young people aren't allowed to go and study abroad, there's a sense of complete isolation from a world that is increasingly globalized. What, what's going to happen to the, the future generations there? Well, I think one has to say, first of all, there's no quick fix. Um, uh, one of the reasons, and I'm not doctrinaire about this, but one of the reasons for greater engagement I is that that can, over a long period of time, through a period of os uh, a process of osmosis, if you like, if you introduce different way of doing things at a company level and build up a stock exchange or something like that, th then you need the rule of law for that. You need a business law, which would um, bring back the idea of, of the rule of law. That might work. I don't say it's guaranteed to work. If that doesn't doesn't happen, Burma will become progressively an annex of China uh, and also um, uh, of great interest to India, of course, because of its natural resources. Um, and um, it's, it's pretty bleak. And I think that um, engagement might be worth, uh, constructive engagement, as it's, as, as it call, uh, as it's called, uh, might just be worth a try. I mean, are you uh, just a quick thought, 30 seconds, uh, Justin. Are you optimistic that there would be any kind of response from the regime to any kind of dialogue? Not at the moment. I mean, you've got to remember that, uh, as far as Britain's concerned, Britain was the former colonial power, and these people, these generals, uh, they don't forget that, and uh, they're not going to preach. No. They're not going to be preached to by by our spirits. Okay, Justin Mittal, thank you very much. Zoya Pan, thank you very much as well for joining us for the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us with your questions. Now, remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and see what we're up to there. You can give us feedback on topics and post your questions and comments. On the next show, we look at the flourishing global black market business of smuggling contraband items such as guns and nuclear materials into countries under international sanctions. How influential are these shadowy networks and to what extent are they transforming global politics and economics? Have your questions ready for that and tune in from me and the team. Until next time, goodbye.